2. Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, how valuable are Hawaii's native forests? Aloha and welcome to Insights. I'm Mahialani Richardson, your host for tonight's program. According to the State Department of Land and Natural Resources, Hawaii has lost more than half of its watershed forests. The native trees have been harvested for wood, cleared for development, or attacked by invasive species. These forests are more than just part of the lush green backdrop in a tropical home. They also help replenish our island's drinking water supply, prevent erosion, and provide a home for many native species species, many of which are endangered. We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our panel. Lisa Hadway is the Administrator for the Division of Forestry and Wildlife within the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. She's responsible for management and oversight of nearly one million acres of state land, including forest reserves. Ulalia Woodside is Kamehameha School's Regional Asset Manager. She oversees the Natural and Cultural Resources Management Division. Ms. Woodside also represents Oahu on the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Jim Romaset is a professor of economics at the University of Hawaii Manoa. His research interests include environmental and resource economics, as well as water and watershed management. And Sam Ohugon is the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii's senior scientist and cultural advisor. He began working as an ecologist for the conservation organization in 1986. And good evening to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Ms. Hadway, I wanted to start with you first because there's actually breaking news right now of a fire in Mililani Malka um, damaging an incredible amount of land and threatening some native species. Can you talk about that? Sure, sure. So right now, as of this evening, the fire is approximately 400 acres, and it's burning in the um, Oahu Forest National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we actually are assisting uh, our partners, the City uh, Hawaii, uh, Honolulu Fire Department, along with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, has staff uh, on hand. Today we had five helicopters working out there. It's in a really remote place. There's no roads or trails there. So the only way to fight the fire was um, with the helicopters. Um, we have it about 30% contained um, and we'll be working back tomorrow um, come day, daybreak with three helicopters. And uh, potentially LA Payo endangered yeah, because they, of this fire? Uh, the Which area, is a bird. yes, uh, the area has approximately 22 listed endangered species in it, um, and as I understand it, it's some of the, a really beautiful piece of intact native forest, including things like sandalwood. And the firefighters were telling me that they could just smell the sandalwood scent in the air, and it's a real loss because yeah. once these areas burn, they don't recover typically. It's often um, you know, erosion and uh, invasive species come in and replace, and those fires may occur more frequently in those types of situations. Right, and in, in this particular situation, uh, you don't know if this is man-made or something that was sparked by nature. Yeah, we don't know the cause at this point. So, Dr. Gon, when you hear about something like this, um, you know, we still don't know, but much of our native species and native forests being lost, uh, it's man-made. Well, a lot of the loss of, loss of native forest has been as a, a result of human activities, either directly or indirectly. And when you think of a forest that was converted to, say, vast acreage of sugarcane or pineapple, um, all of those kinds of things uh, have occurred. Nowadays, though, it seems that the majority of losses aren't as a result of, of development of, of forested lands because of the zoning that occurs, right? Now we have conservation district, agriculture, and the land uses that are prescribed for each of those places are, are pretty strictly adhered to. Uh, it's pretty remarkable um, that since 1903, you know, when the, when the forest reserve system was set up in the Hawaiian Islands, um, one of the first forest reserves yeah. in the United States, even before Hawaii was a state, um, that uh, boundary of forest and the reforestation efforts and the protection of native forests has kind of been a legacy today. What we see now is a result of 100 years ago, um, some 
uh, a partnership of, of private and public uh, uh, organizations and agencies working together mm -hmm. to protect what they recognized was the heart of the future of, of uh, quality of life in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Woodside, let's talk about Kamehameha Schools. Uh, Kamehameha Schools with the state, the, the largest landowners in Hawaii. What is Kamehameha Schools doing to protect these native forests? And, and how important is it to preserve these forests? It's interesting that um, Sam brought up the beginning of the forest reserve system in Hawaii. And actually, the trustees of Kamehameha Schools um, kind of set aside their lands to be part of a forest reserve even before the territory at that time um, set aside their forest reserve. They recognize the importance of those lands and in some of our research that we've done in pulling together our natural resource management plan and other plans, we look back to this quote by um, Charles Reed Bishop, um, trust, first trustee, really telling us that large landowners would be wise to really set aside, reforest these upper regions because they do all of those things that you said in your opening. They help to um, really great 1800s language, you know, help to hold back the freshets of the, of the water and prevent erosion in addition to having other values that we, we see today. So there's a long history that Kamehameha Schools has um, with managing its lands, protecting forest areas, them as very important um, both to the value of the land itself to the natural resource value and those ecosystem values to the cultural and spiritual cultural identity of its beneficiaries and that well-being that it brings to all of us in the fresh water that we that we drink and the clean air that we are able to to breathe so um, we set aside quite a bit of land to manage in that way and really see it as an important kuleana that we have to achieve our mission mm -hmm. uh, professor you've actually studied this in in dollars and cents uh, what's the value of our forests and and what's the value of our forests that are diminishing so i have to mention how I got into this. Um, one day the secretariat uh, head for conservation biology, Nancy Glover, came into my office and she was working on conservation along with the Nature Conservancy and other advocates for a long time. And she said, the reason, what happens to me when I go to the legislature is they just look at us like tree huggers and they say, well, they're well-intentioned, but they don't take us so seriously. So she realized there was a movement in other countries and in the mainland US evaluating the environment in dollars and cents. So she asked us, with the help of the Nature Conservancy, to look into that. And we did a preliminary study um, one of the main focal points was the value of the Ko'olau forests, mm -hmm. which turned out to be in the neighborhood of 11 billion. And by uh, rough estimates, it looked like we could do a lot. In fact, the Ko'olau partnership was saying, you could do a lot of uh, conservation with $20 million five million a year for three years and then maintenance after that to remove the invasive species and restore the watershed and cut down the degradation because it's not like a piece of machinery that you might be able to preserve. If you, don't, if you ignore the watershed, it's going to depreciate by itself because of all these factors that have been mentioned already. Mm -hmm. Dr. So, Gunn, what did yeah. those numbers mean to you when you heard this? Well, you know, I think uh, deep down we all recognize that there's huge value, right, in forests. To put a number on it in terms of, say, 11 billion, and I would say for, per year, right? Um, that Present kind value, of. Actually. Yeah. So 11 billion per year, not just 11 billion and you've finished paying for it. Uh, every year, $11 billion worth of value comes out of the Ko'olau Mountains. And, and so to invest a small pr fraction of that toward maintaining the quality of that, of that asset um, is on the, on the economic side of things, wonderful. But it's like those uh, Visa commercials, I forget which credit card, right? It's like um, 
pair of shoes is you know eighty five dollars, and then the the look of joy on your child's face, mm -hmm. priceless, <laughs> right? And so when you're up in the mountains, when you're see, when you're standing in the middle of an intact forest, when you recognize that what you're looking at is the legacy for the future of everyone who lives in Hawaii, um, when you're standing there and realizing that you're looking at a connection that would have been valid five hundred, a thousand years ago to someone standing there. Um, then you, you recognize that far and away above the $11 billion is the value of, of Hawaiian forests. For, professor, can you break it down in simple terms? I mean, $11 billion, you know, not saying you have to add everything up, but what is, what is that really? So I mentioned a technical term I should probably clarify. Uh, present value is the asset value. Mm -hmm. So you get a stream of benefits over the years, just like a company generates revenue. And so the asset value of that is the 11 billion. The biggest part of that in our study was the value of the forest in recharging the aquifer. So if you think of what if everything were covered by asphalt, then the rain would just run into the ocean. There would be no recharge. And so what the forest does is allow the rain to infiltrate so there's still a balance between there's some runoff, there's some evapotranspiration that goes into the trees, and there's some recharge. So the better the forest, the better the recharge. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Hadfield, do, do you see that there's a change in thinking in terms of uh, protection of our forests? You know, certainly um, the wonderful partnerships that have really been gathering steam over the last decade, um, the watershed partnerships, as, as you mentioned, we manage a million acres um, in the Division of Forestry and Wildlife, but when we look to work with our partners across the state, there's 11 watershed partnerships with private landowners, other NGOs, other government agencies. We actually make that number closer to two million acres that we're collectively managing. We're pooling resources, we're um, you know, working across land boundaries. Things don't <laughs> end when there's a TMK line. So that's been a wonderful, um, uh, we really leverage each other's funding. And that's actually something to consider in, in, in all the value that these forests have. DLNR itself only has 1% of the state budget. And, you know, the return on investment of, of what we put into the forest and w to manage it is just massive. So it's a really good investment for the future and future generations. How is the, you know, the, you've mentioned in the past uh, kind of the face of the forest uh, in, in getting people to relate that mm -hmm. th this is not just. Uh, you know, for some people, it's not just a tree, it's not just a bird, there, there's a human side to that. Right, and one of the things we're working towards um, this kind of coming legislative session is talking about how we view healthy forests mean healthy people, healthy communities, a healthy economy, and, you know, connecting people there. And so watershed is really important, but we also want people to experience it, um, feel it, smell it, touch it, um, mm -hmm. and you know, people getting out, whether they're hunting, hiking, they're, they're out in nature, and that's a lot to um, people's health, uh, getting active, both physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working uh, towards getting, getting people to recognize um, from the summit to the ocean. There's, there's you know, a lot of, and, and for Kamehameha Schools and, and our mission to improve the capability and well-being of people of Hawaiian ancestry to, through education, that well-being of people really comes from the place where we live and our environment. And there's so many olelo no eo yeah. that really are those foundations for the way that we think. One of them that just came to mind as you were talking, Lisa, was mohalei kavai kamako kapua, and speaking about that vai, that water, and the faces of the flowers unfurl, um, in the in the water um, and we talked about the watershed and and really our people our children we can bloom and grow our our pua are our children and they are they mohala they bloom and they blossom and they can reach potential in places that have vai and are in a healthy condition so it just um, really connecting those people yeah. to it are, are really important what do you think private landowners should be doing to protect the forests 
private landowners should look at their, their kuleana, look at those lands, um, see what those lands do to contribute to number of different um, returns or values. So sometimes we look at a single bottom line and an economic return, but we see nowadays that we have multiple bottom lines and recognize that we can be socially responsible um, landowners or, or businesses and corporations and look at that social component, cultural component, and environmental component in addition to looking at our economic bottom line. So at Kamehameha Schools, we have you know, five values that we manage our lands by, those returns that we, we try to look at, and economics being one of them, financial return, but mm -hmm. recognizing that the cultural heritage of these lands are so important and tied to the value of the forest and those natural resources, that stewardship value of caring for them, that this is a place of community and people, so how do we engage that social aspect? And they're also great outdoor learning laboratories and classrooms. Mm -hmm. So how do we engage our students in, in learning about these places as well? So I think you know, looking at a multiple bottom line is something that other landowners and corporations can do as well. Uh, Dr. Gon, it's interesting to, to talk about you know, the real value in dollars and cents, but you're also, you, know, you come as a cultural practitioner. Do you see the, the value of, of, of you know, learning about the culture as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, what I heard just said now, um, that the responsibility of a landowner might be to learn about what their assets are on their lands, and in fewer, few places, um, outside of Hawaii, can you find such a specific um, relationship between people and the lands that they're, that they're on? Um, and in Hawaii in particular, very specific resources tied to very specific places. Um, just above my house on Aleva Heights is Lanihuli. And Lanihuli is one of those places where in song and in chant and in story, um, the celebrated Pua Ahihi, which is a kind of a, a ohia, um, grows there and it's one of those that is so windblown that all of the stems are flexible and the flowers hang if they're, if they're not blown in the wind. They're gorgeous to look at and they're the subject of song. We should pull out the ukulele and start singing songs <laughs> there. But the thing is, um, anyone from the Uwanu, from that place um, in, in, in uh, past times would know exactly that's the name of my mountain. The pua ahihi grows there. They would know about the snails that lived on those, on those plants. They would be proud of that. That would be part of the, the legacy of their place. And they would tie themselves as people to those things. They would not separate themselves from, from the resources there. So every place you go, every island you go, those kinds of relationships existed and can still exist. Yeah still do exist for some people. We have a question from uh, David of Kaneohe, and he talks about uh, you know, us being the invasive species capital of the world. I mean, we, people love to throw that title around. And um, uh, Ms. Hadfield, you know, in terms of invasive species, what is the state doing to really uh, go after those in terms of a, a plan? Well, certainly the, uh, along our department, along with five other state departments, form the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And so it's all the department heads um, from Department of Agriculture, DBED, um, and they all work together collectively on the council and um, work towards uh, putting funds uh, both for stopping, hopefully, further invasive species from coming in, but also trying to tackle the ones that have already made it here from further establishing, such as the coconut rhinoceros beetle is getting worked on right now. Um, little red fire ant, I mean, it's, it's moving through the state and we're trying to prevent that from happening. And so it's a real collective, it's not mm -hmm. just the efforts of DLNR. We also have very well established invasive species in some of our forested areas. And our crews, uh, we have amazing staff that, you know, they go out on Monday morning and they don't come home until mm -hmm. Friday often. And they're out there working in the pouring rain, you know, camping in the mud, but they claim to have some of the best jobs in the world. So that's actually what we do a lot of um, youth conservation core work. We work with Kupu um, and we do a lot of um, job, green job training and getting kids out in the forest to, you know, think about a future in natural resource management. And my apologies, your last name is Hadway, Hadway. by the way. <laughs> so sorry. Can uh, I add something to Yes, that? Professor, what is the, you know, in terms yeah, of invasive so, species, there's so much being spent uh, oh. to try to get rid of them, but, you know, where do you see things from your economics so perspective? it would help the audience probably to have an example. So the Myconia tree, 
um, is one of the risks to the watershed. It's taken over 70% of the landscape in Tahiti. And what it does, it's actually a beautiful ornamental, which is why it was brought here, but it tends to kill off the understory. So the ground becomes hard and the water pools in the leaves and falls off in huge drops and runs off. So it becomes a tree that's a little bit better than asphalt, <laughs> but not as good as other trees, uh, other trees that have already been here. Not only native trees, but when, if you look at pictures of Nu'uanu in the 20s, it was entirely denuded from cattle ranches. So when they replanted, it wasn't only native trees, it was all kinds of different trees. But we know that that was good for the aquifer because even though they were using a lot of water for sugar, the well levels went up. And of course, now they're going back down again. I'd like to say a little bit of something about invasive species. Mm -hmm. That, that, that uh, viewer mentioned that Hawaii was viewed as the invasive species capital of the US, let's say. Um, and there's a good reason for that. When you look at the Hawaiian Islands, we're in a tropical setting, but you can have everything from snow-capped um, alpine systems to tropical wet, warm to the wettest spot on Earth to nearly the driest spot on Earth. Every single uh, ecological um, setting that you can imagine might be here, which means that for any invading organism anywhere in the world, they could find their sweet spot somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands, establish a foothold, and then find how far they can spread from there. Um, sometimes it's not a matter of whether or not the environmental conditions are right, it's whether their enemies, their natural enemies that they left behind because they were brought, brought in, um, aren't with them and so they're free to spread completely uncontrolled. Ms. Woodside, is it, is it a completely losing battle? Just, uh, I mean, sometimes invasive species are just brought in by the wind. I don't think it's a losing battle. Um, we, it does take some concerted effort. It does take resources and money. But um, as we were speaking before the show started, um, sometimes you have to put in that investment in the beginning, or as you were talking about, make this investment in the first you know, five years, and then you get into a maintenance phase. So you have to really get a handle on it, get some control, and then you can, you can uh, move into a maintenance phase. And mm -hmm. in some areas with certain invasive species, we've been able to demonstrate that success. Um, partly when we work with um, partnerships, it's helpful because invasive species really don't know boundaries and they don't um, mm -hmm. manage those landowner lines. But you can see across landowners sometimes, when you put in the concerted effort in an area, like with the Himalayan yellowberry or rubus, and you really focus on it, you can get it under control where in other areas you can see it just, just taking over. But it does take resources and it does take some effort. Well, um, what, what kind of resources are you talking about? Uh, what kind of resources, let's say, has Kamehameha invested? And what's the return on investment? So it, that's a great question. So every year we really look at our lands and look at those priority watersheds that we have in those landscapes. And some of them are areas where they've been in ranching for a number of years and the area is denuded. And we look to how we can bring, bring back that forest, bring back that landscape, um, and re really bring back a native forest that is also an ecosystem and contributes to our watershed. But at the same time, we recognize that we have a, a use relationship as well with these places. And how do we create an abundance of native resources that for future generations, we can contribute to, to their needs and cultural practices. If we wanted to build a koa canoe today, mm -hmm. um, a long voyaging canoe, we know when, that, when the Polynesian Voyaging Society tried to do that many years ago, they weren't able to find koa in that way. And if we don't make a concerted effort to grow and, and propagate our koa, we might never be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think we really want to create that abundance to be able to have um, future generations be able to continue some of these practices with the resources from this place. Uh, Professor, how do you get businesses to see that there is a return on investment in, in protecting these areas, these, these forests? Well, just on the rate of return, um, let's say that if we don't do anything, the value of the forest goes from 11 to 10 billion, which is not that much, only 10% down. And we could uh, avoid, well, we'll probably go down 2 billion, but we can avoid 1 billion 
uh, by spending 20 million. So that's a return of 50 to one. So you think about other things we're spending money on like rail, which we think has benefits less than costs, uh, we probably end up spending seven billion. And so here we're asking for 20 million. It's a great rate of return. The business, business people are already aware of it. There was a survey done and they said, the most important thing for us ahead of infrastructure is conserve the resources and especially water. Uh, Ms. Headway, uh, you know you have to go to the law, you have to go to the legislature and ask for money all the time. And is it is is it really that easy to just say, oh yeah, you know, there, there's a huge return on an investment in protecting these forests? I mean, how do you get people to really see the value? I think. You know, having having these kind this kind of information, having UH professors involved, having a broad um, spectrum of the community part of the story, I think, is really critical to help get the message through. But having tangible numbers, fifty to one, I mean, that's that's really impressive. And you know, we're talking about. I think one thing we maybe haven't touched on is just how unique our forests are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're essentially we are the most isolated island chain on earth and the species and the plants and animals we have here are basically found nowhere else except here and sometimes one valley will have a species that another valley won't they're different on each island and so this is this is a treasure not only for the people of Hawaii but it's a treasure for the people of the world mm -hmm. and it, it's a, a big responsibility to take care of all of that and I think it's just it's a great um, great to have a broad spectrum of people um, to, to have concern. Um, one of the firefighters uh, that spoke today was really talking about the value of the watershed and the impact of invasive species um, of the fire out there. And, you know, we, along with perhaps the invasive species capital, we are the endangered species capital of the world. Out of the U.S., we have nearly a third of all of the endangered species listed are from here, and 78% of the extinctions that have happened in the U.S. are from Hawaii. Uh, Dr. Gan, how, how much has development contributed, do you think, to the loss of forests? Well, over the course of centuries, um, it, uh, I think that uh, development in terms of uh, places where people live, places where agriculture has spread, um, those kinds of things have done their have done their share in the lowlands. It used to be said that, um, say, in the 70s or 80s, and if you went anywhere below 2,000 feet, you'd have a hard time finding a native a native plant or animal. Um, nowadays, you might have to push that up a little bit, 2,500 feet or 3,000 maybe, uh, on some islands, Oahu in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there has been that historical effect, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, nowadays it's the insidious biological effect, right? No longer are those places being, being developed because they are now in conservation district, but uh, you know, the, the invasive plants and animals don't know those boundaries. They ignore those boundaries and they move in to anywhere that they, that they can. So uh, while, the, while in history that has been a, an important factor, nowadays it's less important than the biological factors. Well, tonight we're having a discussion about the importance of Hawaii's native forests. We invite you to join the conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. You can call 973-1000 on Oahu and 1-800-283-4847 from the neighbor islands. Let's go back to Ms. Woodside and, and Kamehameha Schools. What are some specific programs that are out there that, that are really protecting some of the forests? Our programs have four, four program areas, and one of them is to better know our lands and, and the species that are on them. The second area of our program is, is to help clean them up, ho'oma'e ma'e. Let's look at where we have our invasive species and let's get them under control. Once we finish looking at our ho'oma'e ma'e, we move into how do we restore those lands. And importantly, in our final phase of our restoration efforts, we look at how do we ho'olu, how do we continue to make this relationship, um, continue that bond between our natural resources and our people. And so we do, in, in, especially in ho'olu, we work with internship programs, um, especially the Youth Conservation Corps is a great internship program that our youth can get involved in, as well as the um, 
the pipes internship program that they have, um, the Hawaiian internship program that they have out of the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So they have these different opportunities for students to have continued engagement. And our own program, our Aina-based education program, is a critical program to really getting our communities and our students there in the place so that they can build that long-term relationship and then they can steward those lands, not just there, but hopefully they learn those values, um, practices, and they can take those back to their families, um, to their own communities, and carry forward that malama aina ethic. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hadway, uh, can you talk about uh, climate change and, and how is that affecting the forests? Well, certainly <clears throat> in the lower elevations, the, the dry forests are some of the most heavily impacted. There's very little less. I think, you know, the statistic I hear is that there's less than 5%, but we mm -hmm. actually think it might just be 1%. And so, um, you know, as we um, think about these areas and 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 what how we're going to protect them, um, we um, you know have to really strategize about what we're going to do and where we're going to do it. And um, it's it's uh, it's really a challenge in in certain areas, um, but. Again, the partners really help us mm -hmm. to achieve that. I, I, you know, the, she mentioned dry forests, and 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 dry forests uh, makes you think. Okay, forests in Hawaii. Well, I always thought it was just tropical rainforests, yeah. but in Hawaii, you can have dry forests, you can have mesic forests, you can have seasonal mesic, and then to moist forests, and then to wet forests, mm -hmm. and then to bogs and all right. kinds of things. So when you say forest in Hawaii, you're talking about a broad spectrum of kinds of forests, and in each of those forest types, there are different kinds of trees. In the dry forest, you'll find kawila and llama and and things that you will not find. Um, very prominent in the wet forest. In the wet forest, it's mostly ohi alehua and olapa and other things like uh, other species like that. Ironically, there are more tree species in the dry and mesic that is not dry, not wet, uh, in the dry and mesic forest than there are in the wet forest. So, for some folks who might not know out there, they might not even know that this is truly a, a dry forest. That, that, that this is a forest. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the dry forest. Um, you now you picture African savanna and brushy mm -hmm. brown grass and maybe kiave or something. Kiave, of course, is from Chile and the grass is growing under there and from Africa and other places in the world. The original Hawaiian dry forest would have been 35 different kinds of trees all the way down nearly to the coast um, with, uh, with amazing things growing under them, vines and ferns and the like um, over, the, over the lava and other substrates. So we have very few examples of that left and it's really amazing um, to see them when you find them. And then even more important, to recognize them, protect them, and to manage them. So one of the horns that I want to blow on behalf of Kamehameha Schools is as an ecologist with the Nature Conservancy, one of my first tasks was to classify all of the different vegetation types in Hawaii, including all the forest types, um, map where they are, and then, uh, and then identify priorities for their protection. And if you were to say, let's take montane dry forests in Hawaii, you would say, where are most of those? And you'll say, on the island of Hawaii, and where in the island of Hawaii, in the Kona district, and where in Kona district, in North Kona, in the saddle between Mauna Loa, Hualalai, uh, and um, there's a place called Lupea. And if you had to choose one place to find the heart of the dry forest that remains in the Hawaiian Islands, it would be that spot, and in that spot, um, is, uh, is the Lupea Fence Project of Kamehameha Schools. And when I first visited that spot, they had just completed a section uh, of, that, uh, of that fence that prevented sheep, which were, you know how browser, browser sheep can be, they can denude anything, uh, prevented sheep from moving in on a seasonal basis up and down that mountain flank as the wet, as the moist zone moved up and down over the course of the year they would completely remove all of the seedlings and there was no regeneration, it was just old trees and when they died, that would be it. But now that this fence was up, we went in there and there were, there were seedlings coming up, the roots were sending up suckers of, of, uh, of fresh growth. It was such an amazingly wonderful thing to see mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a forest that was dominated in places by sandalwood um, that, uh, yeah, that it just made me glad to know that um, you could 
uh, do something positive in one of the last and best remaining uh, stands of dry forest left in Hawaii. And that's important to us because, we, you know, traditionally we had a very intimate relationship with our natural resources. You look at these chants and songs that were written and individual species and the connection between the birds or the insects or the snails and their relationship to those species comes down in these chants and songs and we see them as beautiful poetry, but they're science and, and observation mm -hmm. and a recordation mm -hmm. of what was on those that landscape and also part of our identity. So if we if those places go away, then a part of our identity and our ability to connect with our ancestors and with who we are in this place also goes away. So it's extremely important to maintain that. And in speaking of the, the people component in those, those traditional chants and, and, and poetry, frequently the relationship is talked about, and I'm gonna use a Hawaiian word, is, is talked about in kaua, mm -hmm. uh, the you and I. And so when we talk about you know the forest, I'm gonna go into the forest and you and I, Laka, are going to go and do things. That's a real personal relationship that traditionally we had with these places, or we talk about ourselves, mako, we are the, the caretakers, the kahu of these places. So how do we make sure that we have those places so this intimate relationship can continue? Mm -hmm. And then we have those species so that we continue to, to write this beautiful poetry and have this recordation and this inspiration of our identity um, from these places. Professor, I know you wanted to jump in. Go yeah, ahead. Going back to climate change, uh, you would think that if the earth warms up, there's more evaporation and there's more rain, which is true in most of the world. But in Hawaii, rainfall has been declining since the early 40s. And one of the consequences of that is the stream flow is going down. So Delvin Oki at USJS has been measuring these things and has concluded that the stream flow has partly declined because the aquifer levels have gone down, but mostly because rainfall is going down because of the ocean circulation patterns. You know, Steve Kauai has a follow-up question and said, uh, you know, Professor Romaset said that we want to spend $20 million uh, on protecting, protecting the forest. So how much should be spent on the koalaus? Yeah, actually that, was from the Koalau partnership, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. all of that was from the Koalaus. Now, uh, just looking at the website for DLNR, you'll know more, but they've said for 2014, they budgeted 8.5 million. It's 3.5 from taxation and then the rest from general bonds. But that's for the whole Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and. It looks like at least half of it is on the Big Island. So it means for just taking the coal house, we're not really spending what we need to. Uh, Ms. Headway, David from the Big Island wants to know about koki frogs. And, and he's wondering, why is DLNR incapable of stopping the koki frog invasion on the Big Island? Well, first, it certainly has taken over there. I mean, we worked on a project where we had a hope of trying to get rid of them out of a certain area and actually in South Kona, believe it or not. And the researchers that came in from the University of Utah found out that it is the highest density of amphibians on Earth ever recorded was wow. from Manuka Natural Area Reserve. And at that point, we did our best efforts to try and control it, and we realized we didn't really have a way of stopping them. So at this point for Hawaii Island, um, it seems that, you know, people are able to kind of contain and perhaps control in certain areas, but um, it's a matter now of trying to keep them off of the rest of the islands exactly. um, from spreading. Mm -hmm. So, you know, landowners can do various things in and around their houses, and we try to keep them from going higher into the forest, but it's an impressive I mean, that sound critter. Is, uh, it's <laughs> deafening. It, it's is amazing. Kamehameha Schools involved in, in trying to keep control of the those loud and pesky koki frogs? We will be a part with the rest of the partnership of trying to hold that line um, for Oahu and Maui and Moloka'i and Lanai, Kauai, the rest of the islands. Um, and, and so we'll join in with the invasive species um, to do what we can um, in order to, to hold that line. But on Hawaii Island, we're not, we're not engaged in managing um, the koki. Professor, uh, 
looks like a losing battle. Do you think it's just a lost cause in, in your mind? Well, I won't get into the biology, but that is a good example of uh, environmental valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kimberly Burnett of Uhero did a study, and it's one of the techniques that is used in environmental valuation. So basically what they did is say, what's the difference in the value of your home if you have a lot of cokey frog noise or not? So you can actually get a, a economic value from that technique. But essentially, if you have a lot of cookie around your home, your land value goes down. Yes, yeah. it does. Oh, wow. I mean, it, you've been out there in the forest yourself. It's, it's <laughs> pretty amazing. It's amazing. And the, the saving grace is that they're easy to detect. And so the moment they show up on an island that doesn't have them, um, and as long as people are aware and report them immediately, then teams can go in and deal with them before they get out of control. And that's happened a number yeah. of times on several different islands. Dealing with them in what way and is it safe? Oh yeah, um, there are several different ways that, that koki can be, can be dealt with and a, a lot of them involve spraying not, not uh, dangerous things like citri uh, ci citric acid, citric acid mm -hmm. and even caffeine will take them down. Yeah. Um, so I mean, <laughs> not that I'm saying you want to spray your coffee on them. but. <laughs> Uh, someone from Wai'anae wants to know, what is the correlation between water rights and Hawai'i native forests? Can you go into that? Oh, wow. Yes, um, I, I would love to. Um, there is no water rights without water. And so if you have native forests and you have an intact watershed, then you have the water to argue about. Um, if, you, if we don't take the time to protect the source of that water, then it doesn't matter what rights you have because there won't be the resource to, to deal with. So at step one in the, in the, in the stage of, of talking about water rights and watershed protection, watershed protection needs to be primary. Mm -hmm. It's all inclusive, it's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in White and I, for example, that's a prime uh, example of the description of springs that used to exist in the at various uh, valleys and, and areas on, in the White and Eyes that no longer run. And, and it was fairly clear that as the forest declined in the White and I Mountains, as those areas dried up even further, lost their watershed ability, um, uh, you lose the, the springs, you lose the water. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding. Yes, yes, just in I, agreement. Agree. Yes, <laughs> yes in, in agreement with, with Ohu and also to recognize as Ohu was talking earlier, just the area of land that would have been covered in, in native forests, you know, 100 years ago or, or 200 years ago is different than what we have today. Mm -hmm. And it's been changing over time. Um, and so recognizing that the area that would have been contributing to our watershed would have been would have been different over time, and that's something for us to think about. Is we're we're really talking about that upper zone right now, that Vaoakua that we're viewing as that high value watershed. But we can also help and contribute by recognizing that what we do in the Vao Kanaka area is a contributor to either enhancing our our water resources or contributing to to degrading those water resources more. Uh, professor, you know, someone wants to know, uh, Dale wants to know, for a landowner who may have native forests, what resources are available for conservation efforts? Yeah, that's kind of a dilemma because it's called conservation land, which means they have the responsibility to conserve, but they don't necessarily have the resources to do it, and that's the motivation for these watershed partnerships. So they come in, uh, along with DLNR and Nature Conservancy. So it has to be done by a partnership because it's kind of, I mean, even Kamehameha Schools has, has that struggle because when I talk to people from Kamehameha Schools, there's the resource people that say, okay, let's spend our money on conservation. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side, the finance people that say, okay, we need to sell some of these lands and make money. So even within an organization, sometimes there's a struggle. It, it, Ms. What's, Woodside, can you elaborate? What's, what's the internal struggle? I mean, can you? The internal struggle is trying to balance those five yeah. values. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no matter who you are, what organization, if you're gonna look at trying to balance the, your financial return, um, the mission spend, the, the ability to contribute to 
educational programs, which we can see that direct emission uh, spend. Um, if you're going to look at taking care of these lands that you received, that you inherited from your, your benefactor's family, um, when you look at the, the cultural um, importance of those lands, anytime you're going to take more than one, one condition into your, your equation, you're going to have some, some heated debate sometimes and some very vigorous, some very vigorous conversation. And that's where you come to trying to optimize or balance what you, you're doing there. You don't see the organization necessarily going for only the maybe what you would call the highest and best use in some area of putting in a, a resort or a golf course or whatever that might, some might feel is the highest and best use because of all of the negative effects that we could have on those lands. So you're trying to find a way to optimize and balance that. And so we definitely have um, vigorous conversation about that. And it happens whether it's between educational spend and um, keeping our money in the endowment or looking at caring for our lands, even looking at how we develop uh, more agricultural resources and, and turn those lands into healthy lands as well. Before we leave the topic, since the question was, what can a private yeah. landowner do who has native forests on their lands? Mm -hmm. I'm presuming that they have acres, you know, maybe a hundred or more acres of native forests. And if they're a private landowner, um, then, uh, and, and especially if their lands are not in conservation, um, they're probably paying big taxes on those lands. And one of the mechanisms that the Nature Conservancy offers is the conservation easement, in which one gives up the rights to, to um, develop a particular portion of their lands. The tax valuation goes way down. They get a big tax break as a, as a result of that. Um, and they enter into an agreement um, that uh, maybe they don't even have to pay for the manage management of the lands. It might be um, uh, that easement might go to the Nature Conservancy or other uh, land trust in order to manage those lands in perpetuity. So those are the kinds of mechanisms that could exist if you have a large landowner with, with important native resources. Yeah. Ms. Hadway, you had yeah. something to say? I was going to say we have, we have several um, state programs and federal programs that actually um, can be provided to mm -hmm. private landowners to do preservation work, the Forest Stewardship Program, um, Forest Legacy Program, various mm -hmm. uh, tools out there. So natural area partnerships. Natural programs. area partnerships. That provides a two for one match for any investment in land management that the that the private land or landowner puts in. There'll be a two for one match to huh. to augment that. Ms. Hadway, uh, Lori via Twitter wants to know what's the most difficult part of communicating the value of native forests uh, to the public. I think um, for us it. I always love to take people out into the forest and like I said to be able to see it, smell it, touch it, feel it and I think that has a big impact and so how to convey that value when you know you're sometimes driving down the road and you're seeing only high rises so you know we want to connect a lot with kids through educational programs um, and you know, I think just getting our staff out there, um, being at community events and those kinds of things, and again, giving people the opportunity to connect and looking towards resources to actually make our trail system better so that people can actually connect with it more And easily. most kids out there, they're not connecting with mm. it. I mean, yeah. where they're living in an urban environment. We're not right? in an electronic virtual <laughs> world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, what can individuals do? And we're, we're talking about, you know, private landowners, but what can just, uh, you know, everyday people do to protect their forests? There's all kinds of things. I mean, um, when I put a, a little ohia tree in the, my front yard, little did I realize that 25 years later the thing would be higher than my house that amakihi would be coming in during the during the right season and feeding off of them um, i think that uh, the movement it's a popular one nowadays to grow native plants mm -hmm. that's something everyone can do and even if you can't go hiking you can at least enjoy the native plants that you that you just through your awareness and your care is now back on the landscape again susan from molokai says a reminder earth day is coming soon Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. Molokai Earth Day is a big thing. The yeah. whole community comes out to, to that. They have all of these uh, displays that students put up uh, with regard to how they malama their land. They come up with a theme each year uh, for, for and, and really cool t-shirts that everyone wants to, wants to wear afterwards. Um, so the, the Earth Day movement, you know, April, and April is when Earth Day is celebrated, um, is a big thing on Molokai and should be a big thing everywhere. Uh, professor, uh, someone wants to know, Anita from Waipahu wants to know uh, the value of native forests on tourism. Is there, is there a link? 
Yeah, so in our study, uh, environmental valuation and the Hawaii economy, we went into that, and, the, and part of the $11 billion that I mentioned uh, included ecotourism and just the aesthetic value. I mean, you, th you think uh, cold-blooded economists wouldn't put a value on that, but actually we take that into consideration. There's a method called contingent valuation where you ask people two different scenarios with beautiful open spaces and say urban or something like that. And they actually put a value on it. So those were taken into account. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, you know, maybe 15 years ago we started hearing the word ecotourism and it was something new and now it's, it's uh, happening amongst businesses every day, right? And I think there's a big opportunity for growth in edutourism and voluntourism, mm -hmm. where you have people actually out getting their hands into, you know, the land and helping us plant trees and, you know, really good interpretation and those types of opportunities being able f for people to be able to understand and be um, have the opportunity to learn about what we have here. Uh, Ms. Woodside, would there, there's an e educational value to that as well, right, with students? Absolutely. I mean, there's limitless um, educational value um, from the youngest child all the way to um, a st graduate student, postdoctoral student. Um, the educational, we, 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 we did look at one time um, something like a piece of the forest um, and what it would take if we had all of these students that were able to go to that forest, engage in learning in that, in that place, have these experiences, and what would the cost be if we needed to try and recreate that same experience for them to have that learning that would happen in that place, whether it's just the observation, whether it is the research, and it really is um, more economical not to, I'm sure the economists might agree with me, but more economical for us to actually maintain that forest and that area, that outdoor classroom, than it would be for us to try and recreate um, that same outdoor classroom hmm. um, for our students. Professor, do you agree or yeah, I'm, thoughts? Uh, I'm thinking of, everybody knows Peter Vitusik, yeah. mm -hmm. who's from a prominent Big Island family and a very famous evolutionary biologist at Stanford. And he talks about the spectacular ecological niches in Hawaii uh, that would put Galapagos Island to shame. Yeah. Um, and so there's a payoff to science, but as, as you're saying, there's a payoff to all of us in learning these things and there's connections that you've also touched on with, with the culture. I mean, there's no Hawaiian culture without the aina. Professor, how have you seen people's attitudes change about uh, forests and protection of forests over over decades? Um, well, there's some, I mean, we always think the progress is slower than it should be, but uh, think of this recent initiative uh, called the Rain Follows the Forest at DLNR. So Governor Abercrombie was talking about this. And so it's, it's coming to the conscious, especially the importance of the watershed for the water resources and if we don't do something, we're going to be desalinating water, drinking ocean water before too long. Dr. Gon, your thoughts on that? On, on progress in, mm -hmm. in, in people's uh, consciousness? Yeah. You know, I, I did mention earlier that, uh, that 20 years ago, putting a native plant, plant in, your, in your yard would be unheard of. You know, you would buy an orchid from someplace or get an anthurium or, or like, in fact, many people would think that an orchid was Hawaiian or an anthurium was Hawaiian or a plumeria. But you can point to the different countries from, from which those uh, ornamentals come. Uh, and now, now it's like y you see these obscure, strange looking little ferns and shrubs and sedges on sale at, uh, at uh, um, Home Depot, Home Depot <laughs> and, and kind of going off the shelves because right, people right. oh, what native plants do you have? So the awareness, of, the awareness of the uniqueness of Hawaiian, of the Hawaiian ecosystems and species, that's growing. I think the idea of sophisticated travel uh, tourism mm -hmm. um, is growing so that there's more of a demand to know what is the real right Hawaii 
rather than sipping on a Mai Tai underneath a palm tree, you could do that in Florida or you could do that in any other tropical location. It's interesting because when there, there's a demand, uh, business will follow because there's money there as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Or the other way around. If the Aina declines, then the, money the economy will the decline. Will decline. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's also contributing to the awareness is a sort of a global awareness as well. Nowadays, we're so connected with our devices and our different social media, we can see some of what's happening in other places that may be in a, a worse off condition as it relates to erosion or that 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 what happens when climate change and your inability to care for your natural resources comes together. And so we can Sometimes I think we can see that what, we, what could happen to us if we don't care for our lands, if we don't have those forests to help us with erosion, to help us with our own, our own water system, we can end up like some of these other places mm -hmm. that maybe haven't, haven't done, have been impacted by so many other things. So I think that, more I think that global recently. awareness, when you see from somebody something else, and we're so connected nowadays, it's everywhere, um, that, that's also been contributing to and our awareness as well. Along the lines of global, um, um, Hawaii was just selected as the site for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. World Conservation Congress is going to be held here in September 2016. And, and that note, yeah. we're going to be looking forward to that. But I wanted to thank you all for a really lively discussion and a uh, very hopeful discussion as well as we look toward the future. Thank you so much for thank being you. here tonight. Thanks a lot for having us. Well, next time on Insights, Hawaii's public schools provide middle and high school students with a sexual health curriculum that teaches adolescents about their bodies and methods to keep them safe. But some worry that children are being taught too much about sex too early. Others point to Hawaii's high teen pregnancy rate as evidence that students are not being taught enough. How should Hawaii's public schools educate students about sex? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahalani Richardson. Ahui ho.